Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. We all know that to be true. We all like to hear pleasant words. They bring a smile to our face. They put a little bounce in our step. But we also know as powerful as pleasant words are, unpleasant words have the exact same power in the opposite direction, which is what Proverbs says just a few verses later in verse 27. A worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. A perverse man spreads strife and a slanderer separates intimate friends. And Proverbs tells us that words reflect what is within our heart. A worthless man's words are like fire. A perverse man spreads strife. What we talk about, how we say things, reflects what is in our soul. And that reality is what we are reminded of in our passage we're going to be looking at this morning. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 12 as we continue in our study through Matthew. Now, it's been a while since we were in Matthew, but we're still studying through Matthew, and that's where we pick up this morning. It's been a while, so let me set the context of where we're at in chapter 12. Jesus is responding to the Pharisees who had accused him of being empowered by Satan, and he is in the process of explaining why such an accusation is absurd, and he's exposing the Pharisees for who they truly are. He's showing they are actually the ones who are on the side of Satan. And Jesus is in the midst of his response, and we pick up where we left off last time in Matthew 12 with verse 33. And as we begin, we see that words reveal our true self. Look at verse 33 as Jesus continues to speak. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Now remember, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees here, those who had attacked him. And when he says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or the tree bad and its fruit bad, he is referring to himself. His point is basically this. If you Pharisees are going to declare me bad, which is what they had done in saying that he was of Satan, then you must also conclude that my fruit is bad. But if you believe that my fruit is good, then you must declare me to be good. Make is being used here in a figurative sense. Refer to evaluating or make up your mind. His basic point is this. You cannot declare me to be evil and then say the works that I do are good. If you're going to declare that I'm evil, then you must also say that my works are evil to be consistent. Now, remember what the fruit, what the works of Jesus had been up to this point. Everything he did had been for the benefit of others. They were all objectively good deeds. In fact, no one in the Gospels ever accused Jesus of doing evil deeds. He was out giving sight to the blind, making the lame walk, allowing the deaf to speak. He was healing every disease. He was casting out demons. He was even raising the dead. Those are all good things by anyone's standard. They were helping hurting people. And Jesus' point is, if my deeds are good, then you must logically conclude that I am good. I am of God. That's the only reasonable and logical conclusion based on my deeds. Now, you might remember that the Pharisees were master politicians, and they would not say that Jesus was doing evil when he was helping people. That wouldn't go over too good. And so Jesus is basically backing them into a corner here, and he's pointing out the utter foolishness of their attacks. Because if they would agree that his fruit, that his works were good, and they would have to agree that, they're not going to tell a person that was just healed that that was a bad deed that was done to them then they should agree that Jesus was good because a tree is known by its fruit. And yet the Pharisees were trying to have it both ways. They would agree his deeds were good, but they insisted that Jesus himself was evil. And that is the utter foolishness of a heart given to darkness. And the Pharisees were so consumed with hatred of Jesus, they couldn't even see the problem with their attacks. When a person gives himself over to darkness, reality is they lose the capacity for rational thought. And Jesus is explaining, basically, what you're accusing me of makes no sense. Their attacks, the words they use to dishonor the Lord, well, they would have consequences for them. And he goes on in verse 34. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Jesus calls the Pharisees a brood of vipers. That is not a compliment in any way. It's rather a very clear indication of how Jesus viewed the nature of these men that he was talking to. This was the same phrase used by John the Baptist when he addressed the Pharisees and Sadducees. When they came to be baptized, 
John knew they were hypocrites. They were seeking to be baptized for the publicity. They wanted to go through the motions, make everybody think they were right with God, but their hearts were far from it. And John called them a brood of vipers. Jesus would use the same phrase of the Pharisees and the scribes in Matthew 23. A brood of vipers is a reference to the offspring, the children of vipers. Vipers is a word used to refer to any number of poisonous snakes. So calling these men the offspring of poisonous snakes, that's an image everyone understood. It's an image we understand today, even 2,000 years later. Snakes, vipers are used to convey an image of one who is deceptive, someone who is hypocritical, someone who isn't exactly what they appear to be on the outside. And of course, this imagery goes all the way back to Genesis, where the serpent tempted Eve. The snake, the serpent, the viper is used to refer to evil or hypocrisy throughout the scripture. Jesus made it clear when he uses this phrase again of the same groups of men in Matthew 23. He calls the Pharisees and scribes there, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How will you escape the sentence of hell? Now, why was Jesus so harsh on these religious leaders? Because they were deceiving people, just like the serpent in the garden. They who claimed to love God, they who were the religious leaders and the teachers, in reality, were enemies of God. They were hypocrites, false teachers who were leading the people astray. They should have been at the front of the charge being excited that Messiah had arrived and heralding everyone to come worship Jesus. And yet they were opposing him and telling everyone that Jesus was of Satan. And it's for those evil words that Jesus rebuked them. And he says, how can you vipers, being evil, speak what is good? In other words, Jesus says, you are evil. So really, it's no surprise that evil words flow from your mouth. How can anything but blasphemy and vileness come out of you? It's really impossible for you to speak kindness or truth because the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Our words reveal what is truly within us. What we say, how we say it, reveals what is really on the inside. Now, we all have moments when we stumble. No one is perfect. Just because you say one unkind word, just because you lose your temper on a rare occasion, doesn't mean that you aren't a true believer. But what continually flows out of your mouth, what is the normal pattern of speech for you? It's a revelation of what is within your heart. And the Pharisees were continually attacking Jesus. This just wasn't a one-time flippant mistake, slip of the tongue. This was their pattern of behavior. They were continually accusing him of being demon-empowered. And they said these evil things because the reality was their hearts were evil. Their mouths revealed hatred and animosity for God. No person who truly loved God could see all that Jesus was doing, hear what he was speaking, and then make the conclusion that he was of Satan. Such an unreasonable and hateful accusation could only be made by a heart that was twisted by sin. Now, heart is used throughout the scripture to represent our inner self. The heart represents that which we truly are on the inside. It's a reference to your personality, your spirit, your soul, that which makes you, you. Who we really are is reflected by our speech. What fills your heart eventually pours out through your mouth. Reality is, if you harbor bitterness, it's going to come out at some point. If you truly love someone, that also pours out of your mouth. You speak kindly, you speak lovingly towards someone you love. Really, it's impossible to love someone and not have it overflow out of your mouth. It's also impossible not to hate someone and have that eventually come out of your mouth. The Pharisees revealed the true evil nature of their heart by their rebukes and their attacks on the Messiah. And Jesus used their attacks as an opportunity to teach about the importance of our words. We can each know where our heart lies by what we talk about. He continues, verse 35. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. The evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. The word treasure here in the Greek is theseros. It means storeroom or treasure box. The image used here is that our heart is a storeroom. It's a treasury of all we are. And if our heart is full of goodness, that's what will come out. If our heart is evil, that's what comes out. You can only bring forth what is in your treasury, what is in your store box. And so what you say reveals what really lies within you. James puts it this way, referring to the same topic in James 3, starting in verse 11. 
James asked, does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. James is talking about the tongue here, and he says, can we get both fresh and bitter water out of the same fountain? And of course, no. A single fountain can only produce either good water or bad water, not both at the same time. Can a fig tree produce olives? No, a fig tree cannot produce olives. Can a vine produce figs? No, it cannot. It can only produce grapes. And clearly, salt water does not naturally produce fresh water. We know these things to be true. Fountains only produce one type of water. Trees and vines, they produce one type of fruit. Salt water does not naturally become fresh water. Those are true in the physical realm, and James used that as an illustration to teach us a truth in the spiritual realm. Our words reflect our true nature, our heart. If we continually speak evil, if our words constantly destroy other people, we are revealing a heart that is far from God. What is in our heart will pour out through our lips. And that's why our speech is so important, because it reveals the truth. And if our speech is characterized by evil words, hurtful words, gossip, slander, attacking others, building up ourselves, then something is wrong within our hearts because salt water doesn't produce fresh. If our words continually reflect hatred or animosity, the reality is we really may not belong to Jesus. Remember, the Pharisees claimed to love God. They were in synagogue every Sabbath, always there at the temple making sacrifices. To put it in modern day, they were at church every time the doors were open. But their hateful speech revealed the truth. And the same is a reality today. You may claim to be a Christian, but what do your words reveal about the true nature of your heart? Is your speech characterized by kindness and truth and giving glory to God? Or is it characterized by selfishness and lies and hatred? Our words reveal the truth of where our heart is. And as Jesus continues, we see a second principle. Not only do words reveal our hearts, words are a source of judgment. Look at verse 36. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Careless here in the Greek is the word argos. Now, gorse can have several meanings. It can mean without thought, careless, lazy, or useless in the sense of not accomplishing anything or accomplishing nothing. And oftentimes when people read this verse, they think Jesus is saying that we will give an account for every stupid, careless word that just slips out of our mouth at some point in our life. But given the context, I don't think that is his primary meaning here at all. Rather, I think he is referring to words that are used that are useless, those that accomplish nothing in the sense that they do not bring glory to God. Because remember the context. Useless words were the words the Pharisees had just spoken. The crowds asked, is Jesus the Messiah? And how did they respond? They said, no way. He is of demonic empowerment. Those were useless words. And they would be held accountable for those words. Useless because they did not bring glory to God. And words that don't glorify our Creator are useless words. They accomplish nothing. And these Pharisees would give an account on Judgment Day for their careless words of blasphemy that they spoke. This is the same way this Greek word is used in James 2.20. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Faith without works is our goals. It is useless. The same Greek word that is used here in Matthew. It is for useless words, words that fail to bring him glory, that men will one day give an account for. When people utter words of blasphemy, they are useless because they are not giving glory to God. And any word truly that fails to give God glory is a useless word. And for useless words, men will give an account on the judgment day. Now, the reality is useless speech is something that characterizes unbelievers. Because for unbelievers, every word is useless in this sense. It's impossible for an unbeliever to give glory to God. No matter what they say, their hearts are full of sin. And therefore, sin taints and distorts everything they speak. Because out of the heart, that's what flows out of the mouth. Now, certainly an unbeliever could say a kind word, but it's useless in light of eternity because words that do not bring glory do not please him. And no word spoken by an unbeliever can truly bring pleasure to God unless it's a word of repentance and 
confessing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because their words flow from a sinful and a rebellious heart. Now, Jesus is speaking to unbelievers here, and he's warning the Pharisees that the day of judgment is coming. And on that day, the useless words they spoke will form the basis of their judgment. Because words from an unbelieving heart are worthless. And if that's the basis of your judgment, judgment's not going to go real well for you on that day. Look at verse 37. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now, that verse, if it's taken out of context, could sound as if salvation is achieved merely by the words we say, and that you can either earn or lose your salvation by our speech. But we know that's not what Jesus is referring to at all here. He doesn't mean if you just say the right words, you can somehow fool God and can achieve salvation by some magical phrase, and boom, you're in. Remember, the Pharisees had many of the quote-unquote right words, but they would not be justified because they didn't have faith. Jesus has made it clear our words reveal our heart. Therefore, words are the evidence of whether we are justified or not. The only way to be saved is by God's grace and through faith. Words are not the basis of our salvation, but they are the evidence of the reality of a changed heart. When we are a redeemed person, when we have been justified by God's grace, when we have been declared righteous, our speech is different because our words flow from our heart. And our speech provides evidence if we are justified or if we stand condemned before God. And in that way, our words justify or they condemn us because they reveal what is truly within our hearts. Now, salvation is manifested by our deeds. It's manifested by our words. That doesn't mean if you just say a magical phrase, it means you will be saved. Remember earlier, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus warned that many on Judgment Day will call Him Lord. That is, they will correctly identify who He is. But they will still face judgment because they never had true faith, never had a relationship with Him in their heart. And so Jesus is saying, look at your speech day in and day out. What you talk about, what is the normal course of your discussion? It reflects what is in the treasury of your soul. And if you're characterized by good words, words that glorify God, words that uplift Him... It demonstrates that you are saved. You will be justified. But if you're characterized by useless words, words that don't glorify God at all, but rather exalt yourself, then you will be condemned because it demonstrates you don't know the Lord. See, words will be used on Judgment Day, either in evidence of salvation or evidence of a heart that never knew Him. Now, when Jesus refers to the Day of Judgment here, remember, He is speaking to unbelievers. A day of judgment for unbelievers is also known as the great white throne judgment. And we're given details about that event in Revelation chapter 20. Now that will not be a day of rejoicing. It will be a day of great mourning. And every unbeliever will appear before the throne to give an account of their actions and their words. And we're going to briefly look at it because looking at the details we're given in Revelation 20 help us to understand what Jesus is referring to here when he says, you will stand on a day of judgment. We read this in Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 12. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the de dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds." See, the Bible is very clear. There is a day of reckoning coming. There is a day of judgment. Now, believers in Jesus Christ will not appear at this judgment, will not stand before the great white throne. This is a judgment for unbelievers only. Now, believers will still face a day of reckoning, but this isn't it. When Jesus refers to the day of judgment in Matthew, he's referring to this event in Revelation that is for unbelievers only. And on this day, all unbelievers will be raised from the dead. They will be given a new body and they will stand to appear before the righteous judge of all the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice we are told both great and small will appear. That's the way of telling us there's no exceptions here. Every unbeliever will stand. The most vile and wicked person to ever have walked the planet will be there as well as the least vile. All who refuse to believe in Jesus will stand before him on that day and they will be judged. See, the Bible tells us that when a person dies, our soul lives on. Everyone's soul lives on. As believers, when we leave this earth, 
our soul immediately goes into the presence of Jesus Christ, where we wait until the future resurrection, when we will be given new bodies to enjoy the pleasures of heaven for all eternity. But unbelievers, those who have not received Jesus as their Savior, upon death, their soul immediately goes to Hades, a temporary holding place of torment for unbelievers. And they stay in that prison, awaiting their day in court. And that's what is described here in Revelation 20. And on that day, they will receive the just judgment for their deeds. This is the day when every useless word will be judged. We're told the sea gave up their dead. Death and Hades gave up the dead. It's a way of emphasizing that all will be resurrected. Even those bodies who were lost at sea, those whose remains were never found, didn't matter if they were cremated or destroyed or buried, all are going to be resurrected to appear on this final day in the courtroom of Jesus Christ. There are no exceptions and there is nothing anyone can do to escape this day. The image presented here is that of a huge courtroom, basically. Every unbeliever is resurrected and they await their appearance. And we're told how people will be judged on this day. We're told that the books will be opened. Notice there's a reference here to more than one book. There are books, apparently in heaven, which record the deeds of all people. And then there is a book of life, which records the names of all who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ while they were alive on earth. Now, if your name is written in that book, you will not face this great white throne judgment. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But for those who appear on this day before the throne, their judgment will be on their deeds. And we're told that these people will be judged according to their deeds, according to what they did, according to what they said. Unbelievers will be judged for every careless word they spoke, every deed they did, deed they did on earth. That's the event Jesus is referring to here in Matthew. Words will be judged. In fact, the Lord will not only judge their actions, but their motives and their thoughts. And as the books are open, the record of one's life will be exposed. And every person will be judged justly and righteously according to how they live their life on earth. Oftentimes, people believe that God will use a balance scale to determine if you enter heaven or hell. The thought of many people is, if you do enough good, it counterbalances the bad. That if you can do enough good on that day, then God will say, you did good enough, more good than bad, come on into heaven. Now, that may sound reasonable, but it is absolutely false. Because what oftentimes people fail to define is what makes a good deed. And how many good deeds do you need to do to counterbalance a bad deed? Is giving your money to the poor a good deed? Is helping someone in trouble a good deed? Is helping someone across the street a good deed? If so, what is that good deed worth? How many good works do you have to do to counter that lie that you told? How much money do you have to give to someone to counter that little bit you stole from the government on your taxes? See, it's important to know what is the standard that's going to be used. How can we evaluate ourselves and know if we've done enough good to outweigh the bad? Well, Jesus actually provided us a standard in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 5, 48. Jesus said, Therefore, you are to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And therein lies the standard by which all men will be judged the perfect and holy character of God. We are called to be perfect just as God is perfect. And if we fail in that standard, we will stand condemned on that day. Because the standard is not the guy next to you. The standard is not how you did compared to Hitler. The standard is how did you do compared to God himself? As human beings, we are created in the image of God. We are called to bear his image correctly. That's the standard by which every human being will be judged. Have you perfectly obeyed God's word for your entire life? Have you accurately represented him every day you had breath? If you have done that, if you have lived a perfect life, then you will have earned eternal life. But we know that no one apart from Jesus has ever been perfect. Therefore, no one will be able to earn the right to live for eternity. We read this in Romans 3.10. There is none righteous not even one. There is no person who has ever lived perfectly. So every person who stands before the throne on that day will be found guilty. They will be found less than perfect. Every person will be found guilty of marring the image of God. Now, some will be more guilty than others. Some have lived a more wicked life than others. But no matter how wicked or how good by the world standard someone might have been, all stand guilty of sin and all stand deserving of hell. 
And that is the only righteous punishment for sin. Now, there will be different levels of punishment in hell for differing levels of wickedness. God is a just and a righteous judge, and the punishment that day will fit the crime. And that's why every person will be judged individually. There will be varying degrees of punishment. But the sad reality is all unbelievers will be eternally separated from God in hell. All will be punished. The severity of the punishment may vary in intensity, but even the least punishment is still horrific eternity in hell. We're told in verse 15, the end result of all who stand before the great white throne. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, it won't matter how good or how bad you think you were. If your name is not written in the book of life, you will spend eternity in hell. According to the Bible, only those who place their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior have their names written in this book of life. Paul said in Philippians 3 that his fellow believers had their names written in the book of life. The book of life is God's record of those who belong to him. And if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, your name is written in that book, and he has promised that it will never be blotted out. You won't face judgment, not because you're something in and of yourself that you did, but because the penalty of your sins has already been paid in full. See, God's justice demands that punishment be made for our sins. But the good news is that Christ has paid that penalty and it's applied to the account of everyone who puts their faith in Him. That's why we're told in Romans 8, 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, His death, what He did on the cross is applied to your account. And that's why we as believers will not face eternity in hell. We deserve it. We stand guilty in and of ourselves, but His blood covers our sins. And He has written our names in His book, and therefore we will not face the judgment that unbelievers do. Those who reject Jesus will face the penalty of their sins. They will spend eternity in hell. Now, while believers will not stand before the great white throne, we will still face a day of judgment for our actions. Believers will stand before Jesus, but in a different setting. And Paul describes this as the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5.10, writing to the church, Paul says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, Paul was writing to the church here. He's speaking to believers. This is something we will face. This is often referred to as the bema seat judgment because of the Greek word that's translated judgment seat there is bema. Now, we don't have the time this morning for a detailed study of this passage, so let me just briefly summarize what is taught. The term bima was used to describe the judgment ceremony of the Isthmian Games. It was the victor of a sporting event that was awarded, and they would be called up onto the platform called the bima. The closest thing we had today, you might compare it to our modern-day Olympic ceremony, where the uh, awards center, where they're called up and given the medals, that would be comparable to the Bema platform or the Bema seat. And so the image of the Bema seat is a place where your life is evaluated and rewards are given out based upon your actions. It's being called up to the winner's platform and given a reward or given a medal, given a wreath back in this time for winning the event. Now, that's a very different image than the courtroom of Revelation chapter 20. And Paul used the image of our life as being a spiritual athletic event. And if we are faithful, if we do our best, then one day we will receive a reward when we stand before Christ. Or we will suffer a lack of reward if we wasted our life and were not faithful to Him. But there is no punishment for those who come to the Bema seat. It's not a place of condemnation. It's not a place of whipping. It's not a place of judgment in that sense. Remember, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we still will face a judgment of either receiving rewards or experiencing a lack of rewards. The Bible tells us salvation is a gift of grace. It is free. We don't do anything to earn it. We simply receive that which He has done for us. But our rewards in heaven, or lack of them, is based on what we do. And that's the image of the Bema seat as described in 2 Corinthians. And it's important for us to understand that as believers, 
we will still give an account of our lives to Jesus Christ one day. You don't get off and you never have to give an account. We still have to give an account at the Bema Seat. And we are to live our lives every day seeking to bring Him glory so as not to be ashamed when we stand before Him. Our words, what we do, is the objective test of the reality of our faith. So as you look at your own life, how would you answer the question, do your words demonstrate that you are justified or do your words condemn you? The reality is, Judgment Day is coming. Jesus warned us about it. Our words reveal our heart. Our words reveal whether you're going to face the great white throne judgment or whether you're going to face the Bema Seat. Which judgment are you headed towards this day? If you are going to the great white throne judgment, then you must be aware you will go to hell. If you're going to be at the Bema Seat, you will enter the joys of heaven. Now imagine with me for just a moment that we could go back for the past week and we could play every event of your life uh, on the screen behind me. And we would all watch together to see everything you did, every place you went, everything you looked at, every word you spoke, everything you thought. It would all play on the screen behind us. And then we would get to evaluate and say, is this person a believer or not? If that was your life in this past week, well, what do you think everybody would conclude after watching everything you did every moment of every day? Do you think we would see such a video and go, yeah, that person, eh, they made a few mistakes, but clearly they belong to Jesus? Or would we say, man, that person, no way do they belong to Jesus. They're living a horrible lifestyle. It must be an unbeliever. How would you feel if it was your life being shown on that screen? To every event, every word, every thought of the past week is broadcast for everyone to see. You know, if you start to squirm a little bit right now, thinking that would cause quite a bit of embarrassment, if you start to get a little nervous because you're not sure that your life reflects Jesus, then I got to tell you, you got reason to be concerned this morning. See, we can deceive ourselves. We can think everything's good because we just go to church and, and we hang around people and do the right things a few times. But the rubber meets the road, and what are you doing day in and day out when no one else is looking? Because I got to tell you, even though I don't have a video camera of your life, there is someone who saw everything you did in this past week. Not just the past week, the week before that, and the week before that, and the week before that. And he's going to see what you're going to do tonight as well. The Lord Jesus Christ knows all things. He sees all things. And he knows your heart. And if your words and your actions don't reflect him, he already knows it. You don't fool him by showing up at a church event every now and then. So we must ask ourselves, do my words justify or do they condemn me? It's an important issue for every one of us to stop and evaluate because we're talking about our eternal destiny. We're talking about the difference of going to heaven or going to hell. See, it's not just about what you say or do on Sunday morning, but what do you do on Monday morning? What do you do on Tuesday morning? What did you do on Friday night and Saturday night? How did you talk to your spouse? How do you treat your children at home? Does your life give evidence that you belong to Jesus even when no one is looking at what you're doing? Now, none of us are perfect. We all sin. It's part of living in a fallen world. While we are transformed by Jesus Christ at the moment of our salvation, we are not yet freed from our struggle with sin nature. And we all struggle all the time. And just because we stumble, just because we sin, it doesn't mean we aren't saved. We all stumble in many ways. The Lord knows that. As we have said often, it's not about perfection, but it's about the direction of our life. So it's not that if you make a mistake or you say something stupid or you lash out in a moment of anger that suddenly that means you're not saved and you're going to hell. That's not it. But what is the overall direction of your life? What is the characterization of your speech overall? Is that evil word really an anomaly or is that more the norm for how you approach things? If you belong to Jesus Christ, it will be reflected in your speech. And if you don't belong to him, it's going to be reflected in your speech. Our tongues reveal our spiritual condition. And that's why Jesus said our words will be judged because they reveal our heart. So where is your heart this morning? Do you belong to Jesus Christ? If you evaluate your words and they reveal a heart that really has never been transformed by Jesus Christ, that's bad news. But with bad news, there's also good news. Because the good news is you can be transformed this very day. And you can come to him in faith and you can repent and you can know for certain that you're not headed to the great white throne, but rather you will be at the Bema Seat. And if you'd like to speak to somebody about how you can know for certain that you are saved and you don't want to go to the great white throne judgment, then please be sure and see me after the service. For those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, 
we are reminded of the power of our words and the need to constantly check ourselves. Jesus made it clear our words reveal our true self and our words will be a source of judgment. And we ought to constantly be evaluating our life and say, what do our words reveal about us? What judgment we will face in the future is determined by whether or not we know Jesus Christ. If your words confirm that you belong to Jesus Christ, then give him praise because you know that the work he is doing is evident of his grace. And if your words reveal you do not belong to him, then I urge you to change the direction of your life before it's too late. The psalmist prayed this in Psalm 19.14. He said, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May that be our prayer as well, that our words would be acceptable in his sight because he is our rock and our redeemer. And when we know him, it transforms everything, even the way we talk. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of it. We thank you that your word cuts through the fog and cuts through the deception that we can so easily blind ourselves with and gives us concrete way to evaluate our life. How do we talk? You said that our true self is revealed by what we say. That out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As we look at our lives and we see that we speak words of kindness, we speak words of love, we realize that is not in and of ourselves. That's because you have changed us. Your spirit indwells us and you have seasoned our speech with grace and love. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the work you are doing. Forgive us for the times that our speech reflects the old nature, the old way. Help us to ever be mindful of the need to guard our tongues so that we might only give you praise and the glory that you deserve. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you that your forgiveness is ever near. Thank you that you are a good and a gracious God and you have spared us from the day of judgment to come when we have put our faith in you. May we be those who are bold in sharing that truth with others, that they may know where they are headed and what is to come. We thank you and we give you all the praise, for it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen.